Welcome back, everyone. I'm the Bella Gamer, and it's finally here. War of the Immortals. The end of my video gaming streak as I have to now cover this book. Now, don't get me wrong. I do really am, am very excited to cover everything in this book. But, oh, man, it is a lot. Goodbye, Metaphor Refantasio. Goodbye, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. It's going to be a bit before I get to play you guys again. But that's okay, because now we have two new classes in Pathfinder 2E. The first classes I have to add to be released after the remaster, though I will say technically, Kineticist was released with the remaster in mind. But after, after the whole remaster, these are the two first classes. And honestly, we have some really good ones here. The whole War of Immortals event the the fall of Gorm and all that is really cool. So or the God's Reign rather is the name of it. So I'm more than happy to it. Though I do have to state before we get started with this video that Paizo did send me a copy, a PDF copy of the War of Immortals book, so I could re record these videos to give this information to you all to make you hyped up for the content, but. This is all my own opinion. All thoughts and, and opinions here are my own. This is not sponsored content. So, you know, I'm going to be as honest and blunt as I've always been. If you have any thought about that, watch my whole monk section of Tian Sha. That should show I pretty much don't have a bias here. So speaking on War of Immortals, I was actually really struggling on what to cover first. And I mean, obviously you click this video so you know what this video is about. This is a video on the exemplar. Granted, it was a big, it was a bit of a tie between this, the animist, or the new mythic rules. So I'm just going to be covering them all in like every day. Every day I'm going to be covering a new class, the mythic rules, or even the new class archetypes and the many other cool secrets found here in this book. So I recommend subscribing if you want to see any of that, as I'm going to be producing a video every day. But enough of the preamble. Let's go ahead and talk about the Exemplar. So the Exemplar is a rare class, though it's not going to stop anyone. Let's be honest with ourselves. And its predominant focus is the swapping between different magic items is the best way to put it. They're called icons and you're swapping between these icons pretty much every round to do something special with an ability called sparking transcendence. So the class is a very heavy melee focused class or not melee martial class because it can be strength or dex. If you want to go with a range build, it's got good HP 10 plus con very, very solid and it gives you divine-ish kind of power. It's not really a ton. It's de You're definitely not going to be competing with Cleric when it comes to things like Sanctification, but you do have a little bit of that, but we also have a good sources of Spirit Damage, which is one of the least resisted damages in the game. So it's a very good Martial class. Now, I don't think this is going to bypass Fighter by any means for, like, Martial Supremacy, but you get to do a lot of really cool things and you just have a lot more capability of changing up what you're doing in a particular battle more than a fighter would. So like many other the marshals, the exemplar has a lot to offer when it comes to the battlefield and outside of combat so it can compete with the fighter more or less. So let's go ahead and take a look at the core stats here. So as I mentioned before, we have the key attributes of strength and or dex and 10 plus con for hit points. Very solid, sets us up for a lot of really good martial builds, but hey, also if we are going a range build, you'll have some good HP, which is not bad. Now for our proficiencies, we are expert in fortitude and will. We get religion plus an additional amount of skill training equal to three plus our intelligence. Pretty standard fare for our martial friends. We are trained in pretty much all but advanced weapons. Pretty good for a martial. And unlike in the play test, we are now trained up to medium armor, not just being left at light armor, meaning we do have slightly more armor options, which is really good because honestly, I felt like Exemplar, while they did have some good defensive capabilities for some of the resistances with some of the icons, which I'll mention in a bit, they were still kind of squishy, especially if you're going up against a boss who has a couple levels over you, you were just likely to be crit. 
and that's not good. So having at least, you know, medium armor proficiency is very solid. So the core aspects of the exemplar are the icons. Now you get three icons starting out, but there is a feat later that you can, allows you to select a fourth icon if that's what you really want to go with. And these icons are essentially like imbued implements, either a weapon, a worn icon like shoes or armor, or a body icon, which is like a particular mark, a scar, a beauty mark on your body. And these icons, these items can be invested with a divine spark, which I'll go ahead and show this part here so you kind of understand what I'm going with. The This divine spark allows you to use two aspects. First is the imminence ability, which is the general passive effect. And then there is a transcendence ability. And when you use this transcendence ability, it's called sparking transcendence, which procs other effects based on your icon and based on your epithets, which I'll get to the epithets here in a, a moment. So you have your spark in any one of your icons at any one time. You never really are without a spark in an icon. And if you do want to use a particular icon without sparking uh, transcendence, which does swap the spark to another object, then you can use shift eminence. Now shift eminence just allows us to swap our spark to any object once per round or anything. It's not even necessarily an object. Any of our icons once per round. And as a special feature to this, you can see here at the bottom, it is triggered when you roll initiative so that whenever you start a combat of any kind, you can just swap it instantly without having to worry about spending that action. Honestly, Shift Eminence is really not going to be used all that much, and that's going to be due to the Sparking Transcendence. So uh, there's a section for Sparking Transcendence, but honestly, it's a little misleading. And I was really confused because I kind of knew from the playtest how this was supposed to work, but the Spark Transcendence thing here, well, you know, let me show you. So Spark Transcendence loosely tells you what it's supposed to do, but it leaves out one really big part. But if you go down to the key term section, you'll get this transcendence description. And this one actually tells you what happens when you Spark Transcendence. So anytime you use these features, your icon that has the spark that you're using the transcendence feature for gets shunted out and it goes into one of your other icons. So, and this can only happen once per round. So you can only spark transcendence once per round, essentially only using one of your transcendence abilities once per round. And then if you do in that same round, want to swap it to another implement, maybe back to your old one, that is when you would use the shift imminence ability that I showed you all before. But if I'm going to be completely honest, many of them are two actions and you're better off not wasting an action shifting it and just continuing on because most of your imminence abilities are useful in combat anyway. So most of the time, every round, you're just going to be swapping to another implement or another icon, sorry. Not to be confused with the Thaumaturge implements. So that is kind of the core aspect of the class. You, you're going to probably use one of your transcendent abilities swap your your spark to a different item to get a different effect and then you use that one and then you can swap between your two favorite ones or you can have some special rotation with all three honestly i'm anticipating people are going to be mostly using the weapon icon and then alternating it between probably a body icon effect but maybe a worn icon effect as well it really depends on your play style and that's something i really like about the exemplar the Exemplar is not really that difficult of a class, honestly. It's very simple once you understand what your icons do. And once you kind of get a rhythm for how you want to play, your combats are going to be pretty straightforward. Sure, you have some ability to change how you play, but it's not going to be so severe that you have to like constantly be reading your character sheet to figure out what your next move is going to be. You, you pretty much have like a small handful of good moves at any one time. And due to the sheer number of icons and the fact that you get three means that the number of different types of exemplar builds is going to be massive. 
honestly, this is like the Kineticist, though I will say the Kineticist gives you, I think, a wider variety of complete styles to play. But what an exemplar is capable of is very vast, which I think I really appreciate. So real quick, before I kind of get on with the rest of the class features, let me read off to you guys some of my favorite icons that you can get a general gist for what these icons can do and what some of the new transcendence abilities are like. So first, let's talk about Gleaming Blade. I like this one a lot. It is for any weapon that's in either the sword or knife group or a melee or unarmed attack that deals slashing damage. So... Honestly, I mean, are there any swords? I don't know, and I'm not going to look it up right now. I don't know if there's any swords that do... No, there's piercing swords. I think the rapier is technically a piercing sword. So, yeah, any sword or slashing weapon. Sword, knife, or slashing weapon. Pretty simple. Applies to a lot of items. Its eminence ability is whenever you strike with this weapon, and it says strikes, it doesn't say melee strikes specifically. So if it's a knife group weapon, they typically have thrown. You can throw them and get the same effect, which I think is really good. But anyway, you get two additional spirit damage per weapon damage die, which is really good because by level three, you should have your first striking weapon rune, which means you're going to be doing or additional damage for additional damage and this could be a two-handed weapon i might add that's a lot the there's not many classes that get this kind of weapon damage bo bonus for something that's not typically like a one-handed weapon so this is absolutely insane now the transcendence ability for the gleaming blade is also really good it's called flowing spirit strike you strike twice oh, it's a two action ability you strike twice using your current multi-attack penalty though if the weapon in question is not an agile weapon the second strike has a minus two penalty honestly a small price to pay and after you make this attack, if both strikes hit, you combine the damage and all the damage is converted to spirit damage, which is really, really good, especially considering some of the feats I'm going to mention a little bit later. Now, the only bad part about this, or not bad part, I should say, it's more like a balancing feature. But if you do do any precision damage, so if you pick up sneak attack, for instance, you only apply that once, which is a little sad. Also, precision damage is one of the easiest types of additional damages to add. So I do understand why this was implemented, but it's still kind of sad if you ask me personally. Regardless, I, I understand it's balanced and I think it should be balanced this way. Otherwise, exemplar would be like doing barbarian like damage, which is insane. Anyway, so you combine this damage, you apply any resistances or weaknesses once. This accounts as two attacks against your multi-attack penalty after the strike. So right here, we have just one icon you can pick up at level one that gives you a two-action strike ability that allows you to strike twice with your current multi-attack penalty. And just in general, just by having this implement or this icon active you get to do two additional spear damage per strike gleaming bay blade is really good and many of the other weapon icons are similarly as good now to talk about a body icon this is an icon that's just a part of your body cannot be removed in any way so a power you always have active we have skin hard as horn this allows you to at the beginning of the day mark your body somewhere with a a, a mark that technically becomes like a weak spot for you, but that's there's really no application for it other than the fact that when you get crit, you don't have resistance, which is kind of lame. But I will say that honestly, more often than not, you're going to get a lot of benefit out of this one. The imminence ability gives you, depending on the type of damage that you mark yourself with at the beginning of the day, whether it's bludgeoning, slashing, or piercing damage, you gain resistance to that damage equal to half your level, which is really strong. But as I said, it doesn't apply against critical hits as they seem to find your unprotected spot. So, you know, it's really good a lot of the time and you're gonna get a lot of benefit out of this. Just straight up resistance for having this icon active. And I have to make mention, this is only when this icon is active. In imminence abilities means you have to be currently, your divine spark has to currently be in it. So the scar you make kind of glows maybe when it's active. In fact, something that I didn't mention before, but whenever you move 
your divine spark from one object to another. It's kind of an obvious effect, so enemies kind of know something has happened. Maybe not where your vulnerable spot is, just because really it's only procced by critical hits here. But you do need to be wary that you can't just be focusing on your weapon all of the time if you want to get benefits from skin hard as iron, or sorry, skin hard as horn. But I will say one of the cool things about this one is you can make your gleaming blade strike, for instance, and then invest in your body icon for no additional actions. And then you just get that resistance until the start of your next turn. And then you could either use your transcendence ability here, which I'll go ahead and talk about, which is crash against me. Uh, it allows you to, in this, until the start of your next turn, you have resistance equal to your level of the chosen damage. And during this time, if a creature attacking you is using a weapon that deals the same type of damage as your resistance, either misses you or fails to do damage due to that resistance, the weapon bounces off of you so hard, in fact, that they take a minus two circumstance penalty to all further attacks with that weapon until the start of their next turn. So the real cool thing about skin hard as horn is at the beginning of the next turn say again you use the gleaming blade you use the two action then you you swap to the horn you're protected until the next turn and then on that next turn you use the transcendence ability bam go back to your weapon sure you can't use its transcendent ability but you can use your strikes and you still have the protection of your resistance meaning skin hard as hard as horn is going to be really good if you're, you're swapping between two of your icons specifically but it's not as good if you're kind of using all three because in the rotation where it wasn't used in the current turn or turn after it's going to fall off which is a little unfortunate but i think for a lot of people skin hard as horn is going to be a very good pick and let's finally talk about the victor's wreath uh, i i view this as kind of like the Oh, goodness. I know what it's called, but I can't think of the name at the moment. A laurel there. It's in the text here. A laurel like on your head that glows with a kind of like an eminence uh, or like a like a divine providence kind of thing. So anyway, this wear, whether it's a headwear or a belt or something, some kind of wreath. Uh, you can you can style these mostly however you want. Honestly, it really doesn't matter. But its eminence ability is insanely good. You inspire all your allies within a 15-foot emanation of you, giving them a plus one status bonus to attack rolls. That's almost as good as bless. I know my cat's butt is here in the way. Uh, we'll just have to deal with it. But it's really good. Just You can just do level one. You can just do this. You can just have this active if you really wanted to all the time. Like... Well, not a style of play I would recommend using. You could just ignore the whole swapping mechanic altogether and just benefit from this one ability, giving you a slightly worse bless effect. But honestly, considering it's free, it's really, really good. Now, its transcendence ability is similarly really good. You One moment till glory is a singular action that you use. You rally all your allies, and any allies in your aura make an immediate attempt on a new saving throw against a negative effect or condition currently affecting them with a plus two status bonus to this check and even if the effect would not normally allow for this new kind of saving throw like for instance an effect that just like they're just deafened for a minute and that's it no saves or whatever this will allow you to probably roll like a counteract or something like that it says saving throw so i don't know if the uh, this is kind of one of the weird parts about this one i have to admit where i don't know if like what if it doesn't have a saving throw? What if it's just a thing that happened with no save? What do you do? Is it a counteract check? I don't know. That's probably how I would play it. But it doesn't specify that it needs to be against an effect that required a saving throw. It just says against an ongoing negative effect or condition currently affecting them. So a little bit of bad wording here, but the effect is really good. And of course, the second you use this ability, your one of your other icons becomes empowered, meaning that you're good for the rest of the round, whether it's, you know, hard, uh, skin hard as horn or whether it's like gleaming blade, you're ready to do whatever other actions or defend yourself until the start of your next turn. So I really do love these icons and there is a lot of them. 21 different icons. So I'm sure someone in the comments is going to go ahead and do the math. 
but you get three icons, potentially four, of different combinations of three. Now, the book does recommend that you take at least one weapon icon, which makes a lot of sense. Many of them are really good. And you're playing a martial class, and a lot of your features are generally focused around using weapons. So, you know, a weapon icon makes a lot of sense, but you could have multiple weapon icons. You can have multiple icons of any variety. There's really no limit, but you do need to be aware that, you know, certain feats or abilities are targeted towards certain types of icons. So having one of each would probably be, be the optimal way to do it. But I could definitely see two body icons and a weapon icon working pretty well. And I want to make special uh, mention. So the worn icons don't have to necessarily be armor, but one of the cool things about them is worn icons, like it could be a gourd for all we know, can be etched with runes like you would put on hand wraps of mighty blows. Though you can't benefit from multiple icons having hand wraps of mighty blows essentially attached to them. So that's something you gotta keep in mind. But these icons can be improved with runes as normal. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, another major feature of the exemplar are the epithets. At third level, you get your first epithet, which is your root epithet. And this is essentially like your title. If you're familiar with Journey to the West, everyone probably knows Sung Wukong, Peerless Under the Heavens. And that's kind of what this is going for. You have some kind of title that builds as you go on that eventually comes into like a full title for instance at this point you get the whatever so you become your character's name the brave let's we'll talk about the brave so these epithets give you typically uh some kind of skill proficiency or feats for instance the brave here gives you trained in athletics so if it doesn't say though if you are already trained in athletics you become trained in something else I would say that you could just retrain or just get a free one. Honestly, it's not really that big of a deal. But, and, and to be fair, athletics is always like something people pick really early anyway. Whatever. Anyway, you become trained in athletics, so you get a free skill proficiency. Pretty good. And you gain an ability that happens after you spark transcendence. So when you use, like the Gleaming Blades, you know, Flowing Spirit Strike you get an additional effect. With the Brave, you get the ability to stride up to half your speed in a straight line towards one enemy of your choice as a free action. So you use that strike and then you can move on to your next enemy right away. Now you can't do this to the same enemy more than once in 10 minutes, but pretty much any time you spark transcendence, you can do this towards a new enemy. And considering it's a free action, this adds action compression onto whatever abilities you're already using, which might already be giving really solid action compression. It's really good. Now, again, maybe the Brave and Gleaming Sword wasn't really a good example, but if we were to use like Skin Heart as Horn and their ability where you get your resistance up to your level instead, that's a really good one because you can just move into combat full resistance all for one action. It's very, very solid. So I really like this aspect of it and you get this three times. At seventh level, you get your Dominion Epithet and it does make special mention here. You can only benefit from no more than one Epithet ability each time you spark Transcendence. This actually comes up to one of my first kind of qualms when it comes to the exemplar. And that's going to be, you have to make a lot of hard choices. For the epithets especially, it's like whenever you spark transcendence, now you have to choose between these effects, which range from, you know, useful. Like the brave isn't always useful, but some of the epithets are particularly very handy all the time. So this causes players to have to make choices when they it, it, this isn't necessarily as much of a problem even though you like yeah i'm aware a lot of feats give your characters more capabilities like other types of actions you can do but this feels like it clashes it feels like you have one opportunity and you're going to be in a situation likely where it's like well i have this one really good epithet that's kind of always useful so why would i use my other ones which I mean, they give you other things, so it's not that big of a deal, 
But it's something that I feel like kind of clashes with me sometimes when I'm reading some of these abilities. Uh, let, here's a really good example, actually. A really good example of this is Whose Cry is Thunder, a really cool epithet. And, you know, if we're talking about the naming part, so if we chose the Brave before, then we would be Grumbus, uh, Grumbus the Brave, Whose Cry is Thunder. You know, it sounds really cool even if we're playing a character named Grumbus. Like, the epithets just make your character cooler. But Whose Cry is Thunder is really cool. You gain the Energized Spark feat, which is a really cool feat that we're going to mention here in a little bit, though this one only makes it either Electricity or Sonic. Not really bad, and it gives your character a very strong theme. And whenever you critically strike, there is a loud thunderclap, and the target must make a fort save against your class DC, and if they fail, they're knocked prone and are made deaf for a minute. If they succeed, though, nothing happens. So a little bit of a save or, or, or suck kind of situation, but being knocked prone on a crit specialization effect, granted one that they have to make a save against, is honestly not that bad. But the part I wanted to bring special attention to is when you spark your transcendence. So when you do so, you can choose to become electrified until the start of your next turn, and any creature that touches you with either an unarmed attack or a non-reach melee weapon, they will take a D6 electricity damage as lightning courses back to them. So when you compare this effect to the Brave, there's going to be a lot of situations where this is just going to be generally more handy. And that's why I kind of struggle with this aspect of the exemplar because it's like this is a really powerful transcendent effect i'm going to want to use this a lot and while yeah sure the brave is more situational there are some that are just even more situational or just have effects that don't seem to be as potent that i feel like some of the epithets are just going to override some of the other ones at least when it comes to this aspect now again as i mentioned before they still have benefits to you you still get proficiencies or skill or feats or whatever. But I just want to make special mention of this because it doesn't feel like more options. It feels like when you hit certain, you know, when you hit a certain trigger, you have to choose between options when you probably are just going to have like one favored one and the rest are just kind of going to go by the wayside. It just doesn't feel as good, if you know what I mean. Like it's different than a normal skill action. If you're choosing between two feats that give you two different types of actions, you use those when they are pertinent. But this is the same kind of trigger. So it's not like, oh, this is being triggered on this specific situation. It's always when you're sparking transcendence. So something like Whose Cry is Thunder, I feel is generally always really good unless the enemy is resistant to electricity damage, which is not very common. So, you know. I just wanted to make special mention of this. I don't think it's necessarily a problem, but it does feel like it clashes a little bit to me. Now you get your final epithet, your sovereignty epithet at 15th level. And the one I'm going to show you guys is the last ruler, mostly because I absolutely love its effect. So with this one, after you spark transcendence, you exude an air of authority until the start of your next turn. If any enemy fails and an attack roll against you, you can attempt an intimidation check to demoralize that enemy as a free action, as if to rebuke them for the foolish attempt to even uh, stand up against your authority. This is a free action, not a reaction, so you can do this against as many enemies as you could potentially demoralize. Maybe you demoralize them before and they're currently immune, but that's honestly not going to be that big of a deal. Now, the re last ruler, also really good, but also kind of clashes with Whose Cry is Thunder because they're both defense effects. Granted, this late in the game, a D6 electricity damage probably isn't going to make that much of a difference, and intimidating an enemy is probably going to make more of a difference because it reduces their saves and DCs. But you see what I'm talking about here. We got a lot of effects that kind of feel like they fight for the same position, and some just feel objectively better than others. And like... Who's Crying Thunder, really good. A D6 doesn't scale well into the late game. And so that D6 of damage, it's like the enemy has 300 health. They they, they take, what, 1% HP? Meh. When you could try to demoralize them. And sure, once you demoralize them, you might not be able to do so again. In which case, at least you can get the thorn effect from Who's Crying Thunder. But you know. You know what I mean. I, I think many of you can kind of see what I'm talking about. 
Again, as I said before, it's not necessarily a problem, but I figured I I would give mention of it because it feels like certain actions here are kind of competing with each other. So now that we got the icons and epithets out of the way, let's talk about some of their other class features. So first of all, we have a really cool feature with Humble Strikes. This makes it where any simple weapon that you're currently wielding increases the damage die size by one step. There's no limit here, which is very strange because what happens, is there a simple weapon? I'm pretty sure the Great Club, one second. Okay, I did look through the book. There are no simple weapons currently that deal a D12 damage. So the highest is we can get with this is a D12. But this is really good though. Every time I come up against this kind of situation, I'm gonna to have to make special mention. This is for weapons that have the simple trait not for weapons that your character treats as simple for the sake of proficiency. That's a proficiency thing that doesn't change what type of weapon you're using. People are gonna argue about this, but that's just not how the game works. I wanna make special mention of this because it's a rule a lot of people seem to get wrong. So, but regardless, Humble Strikes is really good. Now granted, because we get training in many martial weapons, martial weapons tend to just honestly deal more damage and have more weapon traits. And so it's like, why use a weapon that has less traits for the same amount of damage that a martial weapon might give you? So there might be some really cool weapons that this works with in particular, and I'm glad it's here, though I just don't know how useful it necessarily is. Now, I, what is really useful is shield block. Yeah, we get shield block. Really good. I love when classes get shield block as a feat. It's a very good general feat. That just helps you mitigate damage if you want to use a shield. So really good. In fact, there is a, a, a shield icon as well. So if you want to go a sword and board style of, of exemplar, there's going to be a shield icon just for you. Other than that, much of what the exemplar gets is pretty stock standard for a martial character, though with one exception. Now we get our martial proficiencies at about the same rate that other martial characters get but we don't get a weapon specialization. Instead, we get what's called spirit striking. So spirit striking is the same thing as weapon specialization, but it deals spirit damage instead. So this is actually really good and actually makes it better than normal weapon specialization because spirit damage is so little resisted in the game it actually makes this damage more viable than standard weapon specialization does. Meaning exemplars compared to other marshals has slightly more effective damage. And this does scale into the late game because we get greater spark spirit striking, which does the same thing as greater weapon specialization. So another really good effect. Other than that, and other than the epithet, we don't really get much else. We get up to mastery in both our weapon class DC and armor proficiencies. So there's not really a cool level 20 capstone for the exemplar, which is a little weird, but it makes a lot of sense. The class is so generally good most levels. It doesn't really need a good level 20 or 19 capstone to really make it super viable. I mean, no class really needs that, but it doesn't need it in comparison to the other classes. Like, if we're to compare level 19 classes together, the exemplar doesn't fall behind even in that regard, despite not having a more powerful level 19 effect. So now you guys know what makes the exemplar awesome. They are a martial character that are bigger than life. They get a lot of cool like passive effects and their gear is just automatically kind of elevated with the ability to even swap out any weapon you have for your icon for another applicable icon magic weapon for instance is really really good but let's take a look at a few of their feats before we end the video so first off i did mention this feat before energized spark i love this one because what it does is any time well first of all you pick a damage type tied to like an element so for instance air is slashing there's just straight cold earth has bludgeoning metal has slashing, whatever trait you're kind of looking for, which means there might be some cool synergy synergies here with like the kineticist, for instance. Anytime we use a exemplar ability that deals spirit damage, 
we can convert all that spirit damage to this type of damage. That's really cool. And you can even take this feat multiple times to allow you to do different types of damage. So if you really wanted to, you could have a weapon that could flip between different energy types. And when you get spirit striking, you can always deal that damage, which is really cool. And of course, many of the transcendent abilities, like with the gleaming blades flowing spirit strike, which converts all the damage to that type, it's really good for getting past enemies that just have standard physical resistance. So Energize Spark for a level one feat is insanely good. Speaking on insanely good feats, at level six, we have Flow of War. This one's also really, really good because once per hour, when our turn begins as a free action, we can essentially quicken ourselves to give us an extra either stride or strike action. That's really good. Now, sure, that probably comes up to maybe once or twice per dungeon run. But even that is very solid. Now, of course, it's a level six feet, so it's going to compete with Reactive Strike, which I know a lot of people really love. But honestly, I absolutely love Flow of War. I like it because it enhances what our character does, and it makes your character feel powerful. Like, you can just move at insane speed at a moment's notice, or you can just hit extra fast with additional blows. Flow of War is honestly really cool, and unlike Reactive Strike, it's an additional strike that you essentially don't have to compete with a reaction for or don't even need to have the reaction procced for. Sure, multi-attack penalty is a thing, but you can make intermix this with other types of actions even better. So I like Flow of War more than Reactive Strike, and I probably select this more often, but any level you could pick this up with, you know, after six level, it would be a really solid choice. And there are many feats here that actually improve our icons by giving them new eminence or transcendence abilities, or both sometimes. And one such feat is Branched Tree of Pain. Yeah, a really cool name here. Now, this requires a weapon icon that deals either piercing or slashing damage, which, you know, with Gleaming Blade, as I mentioned before, works perfectly. And with the eminence ability and with multiple eminence abilities, you get the additional effects. So in addition to our Gleaming Blade that might do additional two per two uh, spirit damage per weapon damage die, we also can get the ability to crit on a 19 as long as a 19 would at least hit, which is really powerful. So Branch Tree of Pain is really good to enhance your critical range just without needing to get like the Keen Rune, for instance. But in addition to this, we also get a different transcendence ability. This one, Plant Thirsty Barbs, is insanely cool, though it's a, it's a singular action. And when it comes to transcendence abilities, you do have to pick which one you're using. But this one's really, really cool. So when you strike the enemy using your weapon with this action, the target immediately takes two of the weapon damage dice, a weapon damage, the first time they use a move action every round or sorry, on each of its turns, which is slightly different than every round. But in addition to these, these barbs stay for an additional D4 rounds. And if the target dies while the barb is inside of them, the barbs explode out of them, covering the entire space the enemy filled, which by the way, can be on a huge enemy. And those barbs create greater difficult terrain and hazardous terrain that deals damage equal to half your level for each square that's moved into. And as an additional kicker, whatever material your weapon is made of, the barb share the same traits of. So if you're striking, say, a fey creature with a cold iron weapon, then every time they're proccing this damage, it's probably proccing their weakness. And when they die, they explode into cold iron. This is so cool thematically. It's very intense. Granted, it's a level 18 feet. So, you know, it's a little bit later in the game. But you can see here how we're already changing up some of the abilities. And unlike, and I, I'm sure some of you probably already noticed, even though, yeah, sure, we have competing transcendence abilities, this one feels different to me because when you want to plant the barb is a different situation than when you're going to use, you know, the swift spirit strike ability, for instance, or flowing spirit strike, my bad. But both of those spark transcendence, no matter what they are doing, 
So your epithet relevant to this, again, like if you can intimidate the enemy, then I would go with the ruler one. And if you can't do so for whatever reason, then whose cry is thunder. But you would almost never use the brave, which is the one, first one we would have gotten, unless maybe you really wanted to save on the action economy. But even then, I don't know. So yeah, this is... Exemplar is really cool. I really like it. Besides my one small qualm, one one teeny qualm with with the exemplar, I think it's really good. I think it's a very interesting kind of step up. Like a fighter is a very simple class that gives you a lot of diversity while not giving you too much to work with. The exemplar, I feel, is like the next step up where you do get some more things that your character is capable of doing and a little bit more complexity, but honestly, you're gonna hit some certain rhythms with your build, and playing your character becomes a lot easier once you kind of understand what kind of rotations you wanna go for. But that's gonna be it, it's a bit of a longer video, and there's gonna be other channels out there that are gonna cover every single feat, so I'm not gonna do that here. I just wanna show you guys why Exemplar is awesome, and as well, for after the fact, for you know when people are just looking at the classes, I didn't want to make a super long video. This would be an hour and a half video if I went through literally every, like, 21 icons. I don't know how many epithets and so many feats. Like, this book is pretty beefy. So stay tuned to the channel. As I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the video, I'm going to be covering content every single day. So if you don't want to miss any of the new goodness, I recommend subscribing. And hey, if you like the video, leave a like. I want the algorithm to see that people want to see tabletop content. So anytime you're watching a tabletop channel of any variety, not just my own, leave a like. Let's raise all the ships here. Let's get tabletop content in the algorithm in full force. And if you're watching anyone else's video on the new War of Immortals stuff, please leave them a like. It really helps out a lot. And we really need that in tabletop. But that's going to be it for me today. Thank you all so much for watching. Good luck with your games. Leave the bad luck to me. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.